Sorry about the technical hiccup, everyone. Our final speaker today is Judith Hunter. And the format of this presentation will be a question and answer session. Judith is from Awabakal and Warimi land in the Newcastle region. She's the mother of a transitioning daughter. Judith's daughter, Mary, experienced rapid onset gender dysphoria as an adolescent. Judith has never given up on her daughter. We'll be discussing today how that experience has unfolded and what it's meant for Judith and the other members of the family. At the outset, I want to acknowledge Judith's courage and resilience in going public about this issue and in tenaciously fighting for her daughter against powerful institutions and a powerful ideology. Welcome to Brisbane, Meange and Judith. Thank you. And to this event. Thank you. The title of the discussion is When Your Daughter Experiences Rapid Onset Gender Dysphoria, A Mother's Perspective. And I'd like to begin by asking you, Judith, to introduce yourself and your family members to us, their approximate ages and what they do and where they live. Thank you. Well, my husband John and I have been together for 28 years and we were married in 1995. When I met John in 1993, he had been divorced and had three little boys. So when I met him, his boys were three, five and eight. Those boys are now 31, 33 and 36, my three stepsons. So I had a lot to do with them over the years. They lived with us sometimes up to four and a half years straight. We had the two youngest ones for the longest time. So I had three stepsons and then my daughter is now 20 and we also have a son who is 16. My stepsons all live in Newcastle. They all did an apprenticeship, painting apprenticeship with our family business. So they've all been very, very close to the family and we have four grandchildren. The two eldest of those boys have two children each now. <coughs> and our son is in year 10 in high school and he lives with us at home. And our daughter is not with us anymore. Judith, um, can you tell us about your daughter prior to puberty? Did she ever express a belief she was a boy? What were things like for your daughter and the rest of her family? What kinds of activities did she do as a little girl? Did she have friends, for example? She certainly never showed any signs of gender dysphoria or wanting to be the opposite sex. She had lots of activities growing up. She tried everything. She, um, you know, she did a bit of ballet, but then she did drama, she did singing, she did tennis, she did some gymnastics, she played soccer for many years through a school team. So very well adjusted. I was a child who never liked dolls or girl, girly things. I was quite the tomboy, so it didn't, you know, she wasn't interested in dolls. She much preferred kicking a ball and being outside, doing things like that. So I found that just completely normal upbringing no she there was no signs at all and but then at the start of 2016 completely out of the blue she started to have very poor mental health and that was the start of our journey of she had three years 2016 17 18 where her mental health deteriorated from the very start i started seeking medical help for taking her um we were first put through the hospital system cams and we tried that we we did see therapists and doctors through the child and adolescent mental health service but didn't seem to get a lot of success or what i saw was help that was making a difference so we then went to private psychologists and psychiatrists and i actually added up 
in the three years from 2016, 17, 18, I took her to over 70 medical appointments associated with her mental health. So I was continually trying to help her. She had been diagnosed over that three year period with anxiety, depression, and eventually bipolar after a hospitalization for a month in July of 2018. And then it was in October of 2018 that completely out of the blue to us, she announced that she was transgender. So how old was she then? She was a month shy of turning 18. By then she was 17 and within her, her personality virtually changed overnight. The loving, caring, beautiful young girl that I had such a wonderful relationship with seemed to disappear. She became argumentative, aggressive. Within a week of her announcing that she was transgender, she was seeing her regular psychiatrist and she told him that she was suicidal, which in reflection, I don't believe she was, but this all became part of the narrative that she had learnt online what to say and, to, and do and he immediately instructed us to take her to our local hospital for admission to the adolescent mental health ward, which we had to do because the psychiatrist told us we must. And from that point in time, when she was admitted to that hospital ward, our lives just fell apart. They immediately affirmed her. They treated my husband and I in the most horrific manner I still suffer PTSD from that experience. It was so traumatic. I Can you tell us a bit about that, about how you and your husband were treated? Oh, well, he stayed with her all night for the admission. And then when I came to see her the next day, which was a Friday, the, I said, I'm here to see my daughter. And I was corrected and told, no, I didn't have a daughter, it was a son. I went to the room that she was in and there was a boy's name above her bed. I said, this is not her name, this is my daughter. I was ridiculed, I was bullied. I was told that if I didn't use the right pronouns in this new name that she would kill herself. But clearly they didn't think she was going to kill herself because the following day they sent her home on day release. Um, because that was a Saturday and all the staff nearly go home on the weekend so they were quite happy to send her home with me and all the Saturday she spent with me she kept telling me she was going to kill herself so when I returned to that afternoon they then asked me to take her out again on the Sunday and I said no I'm not that was far too traumatic what I've just been through all day with her telling me she's going to kill herself so we were called into a family meeting on the Monday. I couldn't get out of bed. I couldn't go to the meeting. I was in such a state of trauma. So my husband and my eldest stepson went to the meeting. At that meeting, we were apparently rubbished, ridiculed. The staff sat in front of my husband and my adult stepson. And I suppose when you were little, your mother dressed you like a girl. So. They had decided they were transitioning my daughter. We went to for another family meeting on the next day, the Tuesday. I just forced myself to go along. I was in such a state. And they just told us, take her home. They didn't want her in there. And we're referring her to the endocrinologist for hormones. And I said, no, we are going back to our private psychologist and psychiatrist. We are not going to an endocrinologist for hormones. I said, I have a 13 year old son who was 13 at the time at home. He's already been so traumatized by this. We're, we're not having my daughter take hormones. You, and I was told I needed to teach my son to be inclusive. So the day after we took her home, my husband rang the head of CAMS in Newcastle to lodge a formal complaint because of the appalling way we were treated. He did get an apology from the head of CAMS who agreed that our daughter would be removed off their books, that there would be no appointments as a follow-up, that um, we were going back to our own GP and our own psychologist and psychiatrist. Yet they did not do that. They 
kept the appointment. She had another hospitalisation in, in a private mental health hospital in December, so only you know, less than two months later. And it was in the December she released herself from the hospital for a day, unbeknown to us, and went to see the endocrinologist for the appointment that was made by the staff at, our lo at that hospital. So she went to that endocrinologist in the December of 2018 and we didn't know that she had gone out of the hospital where she was. And then uh, our family life just fell apart. She became out of control, basically. She was so aggressive to us. Every day I was given a lecture on transgenderism, on me, I was called a white, privileged, boring, bigoted, home heterosexual, every day I was insulted and I ended up, I was just, you know, suicidal myself. I was on the point of having a breakdown. Our son was so distressed by her behaviour, he became anorexic, he would curl up in a little ball on the floor and sob and mum tell her to stop, tell her to stop, but she just wouldn't stop, she just was at us and at us and at us. And by March, of the, she dropped out of school. She was meant to be going into year 12. She dropped out of school. I tried to talk her into going to do a new step at university to at least do the equivalent of year 12. Um, she was just obsessed. And in the end, she called the police and told them that her father was assaulting her. And we got served a DVO in the middle of the night by the police who didn't even bother to come and find out what was really happening so at that point we knew we had to move her out of our house because of what you know she'd taken this DVO out against my husband and so we moved her into student accommodation a few blocks from our house that was owned by a very good friend of ours and we set her up in this accommodation and we subsidised and paid half of the rent there for over 18 months basically from when she moved out in the March of 2019, she went back to the endocrinologist for a second appointment and they put her on testosterone at the second appointment. And I still was doing lots of things for her. I was, you know, a bit trying to keep in touch with her. She begged me to come and see this endocrinologist in the May. So my sister, who's a doctor, came with me to the endocrinologist for the appointment in the May and I had a speech prepared and said, you know, do have you any idea of how sick our daughter is, the mental health problems she's had? They had no idea. They didn't care. They didn't want to know. The endocrinologist sat there and said to me, don't you just want to see your daughter happy? I said, well, I think there's a lot more to parenting than just wanting to see my daughter happy. I said, we have actually got an appointment with a psychiatrist, the only gender psychiatrist in private practice in Newcastle, but it took us nearly nine months to get into him and so that appointment was coming up in the June. Oh, isn't that great? They said, you know, that you've got to take her to that doctor in June the following month, yet they didn't tell me in that appointment that they'd already started her on testosterone two months prior. I had my suspicions, but of course I'd only seen her once or twice other than that day where I turned up at the hospital to meet her. I, I, I still at that point didn't know and it was only our solicitor subpoena in court documents we tried to fight the DVO and it was the documents that we subpoenaed that I found out that she was on testosterone and I also found out that the hospital had wrote up her discharge summary saying that we agreed to the appointment with the endocrinologist. They actually falsified her discharge summary saying we agreed for her to go for hormones and we hadn't agreed. So she went to see the um, gender specialist psychiatrist in the June. We had a two hour appointment with him. He told us he wouldn't have put her on testosterone at that point in time. He also diagnosed her with complex PTSD from a lot of bullying. She'd been through some terrible bullying, prolonged terrible bullying, both in primary and in high school that he felt was the cause of her complex PTSD. Um, she stayed on testosterone, I believe, for about 18 months. She did nothing in 2019. So by the start of 2020, I said, you need help. We got another admission to a different private hospital, mental health 
where she stayed for six weeks in hospital. Then as she came out of hospital, COVID was closing in and I got her to go and stay with my two sisters who were providing palliative care to my very elderly father who we thought was dying. And she went and stayed with my sisters for several weeks to try and help them. And in that several weeks, my sisters saw how ill she was. She, in the three weeks, she barely got out of bed. She wasn't getting out of bed till 4.30 in the afternoon. You're a seriously mentally ill person. And the doctors don't care. They just put her on, they act, the endocrinologist who gave her the hormones to start with then got rid of her because that was paediatric endocrinology. They sent her on to the adult um, service and I did go to one of the adult appointments with her and I was pleading with this endocrinologist. I was saying, uh, you know, uh, can't you see how mentally ill this per my daughter is? She's not functioning. She, she barely gets out of bed. She can't study. She can't work. She's, you know, n not functioning. Your daughter's over 18. She can do what she likes. That was what right. they said to me. And so eventually she did take herself off testosterone last year because apparently there were side effects that were happening that she didn't like. Um, after that hospital admission last year, we got her into dialectal behavioural therapy classes and we started to see for the first time in over four years an improvement in her mental health. And we were seeing a lot more of her. She was coming around on a regular basis to our house. She was having a meal with us once a week. I wonder if I could just interrupt. What made your daughter decide to go off the testosterone? She wouldn't tell me what the side effects were. She said there were side effects, but she didn't want to tell me what they actually were. But I've read a lot about the side effects. I mean, the um, uterine pain, the um, atrophy of organ, genital organs and things like that that apparently take place. I mean, she was getting male pattern baldness, her hairline was receding, her voice had obviously deepened, and I mean, her voice will never be the same again. So, and body hair, I mean, she was covered in hair. Uh, and, and so, obviously, the side effects that were happening, she didn't like, and, and she said that was why she had come off it, because she didn't like certain side effects. Right. But, um, you know, we started to see an improvement late last year, and then my husband's mother died, and then a girl she had become very friendly with in the student house went back to France, and I just saw these series of events seem to make her fall back down the rabbit hole. Apparently she went back on testosterone for a while, and then we found out she was, we just noticed she was back to binding again, her breast, because she had stopped doing that for a while. And yeah, my husband and I looked at each other one day and said, I don't have a good feeling here. And he said, yep, the same. And he said, could she use our health fund to go and have her breast removed? And I said, I'm going to ring our health fund and find out, because she was covered by our health fund. And I rang the health fund and I said, um, could our daughter access surgery to have her breast cut off? And the fellow we spoke to said, um, he looked up at the policy and he said, yes, she could. And I said, is there anything we can do to stop that? And he said, other than removing her from your policy, no, there's not, because she is over 18. And I said, um, can you f tell me whether anything has been done? And he came back, I'd expect him to say, no, I can't, but he came back and said, yes, we issued a quote for breast removal about a week prior to that phone call. So we said, right, well, we, we'll take her out of our health fund. We can't um, oversee that happening. So we took her out of our health fund. She told us the name of the surgeon she'd gone to see and she actually gave permission for him to speak to us. And so we spoke to him late last year. I wrote him a very long letter with all her history. I bought him a copy of Abigail's book, Irreversible Damage, and dropped it into his surgery. And when I spoke to him, I said, were you cutting young girls' breasts off 10 years ago? Oh, no, no, no. I said, well, why are you doing it now? I said, our daughter is seriously mentally ill. Oh, well, she's an adult. Uh, 
anyway, I mean, that was the phone conversation and not much came of it. But then she just turned around before Christmas last year and said that she never wanted to speak to us again in her, her life. And so she blocked our phone numbers and cut us off. She wouldn't come to see us. For Christmas, it was going to be my father's 100th Christmas because he was 99. She wouldn't come and see her grandparents. She wouldn't have anything to do with any of us. And then out of the blue, she contacted her brother a couple of months ago and sent him a follow request on Instagram. And so he accepted it. And then the following day, she posted a GoFundMe on Instagram. So she'd clearly done it for him to see it and for him to alert us. I mean, he was terribly distressed by it. He was so distraught. He, if I read you the letter he wrote back to her, well, you'd just cry. I mean, he was pleading, don't do this, don't cut your breasts off. You know, what happens in a few years' time when you grow up a bit more and you regret that? So, in response to that, I wrote another letter to the surgeon, but I also wrote a letter to the private hospital where he operates and I put a, co I put a copy of the letter I sent to him and a covering letter uh, outlining why we were against her having this surgery in view of the fact we didn't think she was in a position to make a decision like that because of her you know, serious mental health problems. She actually ended up being diagnosed late last year with autism and ADHD as well. So those were also other really important factors to take into consideration. And so I ended up f finding out that the surgeon rang her and said that he would not do the surgery because of a letter I received from your father. But I mean, it was from mother and father, but any, and then I also had a phone call from the private hospital who told me that she was not on their operating lists. And I actually got the impression that the private hospital were on my side, that they, the woman I spoke to wished me all the best. And I, I felt because that would have opened up a conversation at that hospital, because that man has cut the breasts off quite a few young women in Newcastle that I know of. And so, can you imagine what that's like for those operating theatre staff to have a w young girl wheeled in and then the next thing find out that that surgeon is about to cut her breasts off for no reason at all? And so I guess that letter at least has opened that conversation in that hospital, which is, that's a good thing. I've reached out to my daughter recently. I um, found out she moved to a flat a few months ago and her, one of her older brothers is trying to stay in touch with her and um, I found out where she's living. I dropped a card off saying I'd love to have her back in my life. And, you know, we, we only care about her and want her in our life, but I haven't had a response to that. Um, there seemed to be a time, um, I think last year, when your daughter was, um, uh, more inclined to be a part of the family yes. from what you were saying. Mm. So can you tell us a bit about that? Well, I think that's when she was doing the delectable behavioral therapy classes, which were the one thing in all the years of her poor mental health that was helping her. And, but she just decided to stop doing them. And that was, I think then things fell apart again for her. And I, I definitely see that that was, she has, you know, serious behavioural personality issues that from the research I've done of that kind of mental health problems of, you know, PTSD and borderline personality disorders, the best thing is these behavioural therapy classes. But to get any sort of result out of them, I've been told you need to do them for several years to really fix your mental health problems and doing them for a couple of months we saw an improvement and then she stopped so um, you know that's going to be up to her to, to 
try and help us help. To, I've, I've said I would love to put you back in my health fund. I would love to you to go back and do those therapy classes again. I'm trying to get that message through to her through her older her brother her older brother. Um, but that is is going to be up to her. I mean, the other thing I. One thing I did want to mention is we made several complaints to the Healthcare Complaints Commission about, one, the treatment path she was put on by the endocrinologist from the John Hunter. That health, that was dismissed. They said that the hospital had done nothing wrong. That was the appropriate line of treatment to put somebody straight onto hormones, which is in total contrast to apparently what Dr. Telfer said on the recent TV program was that people had therapy for two years and saw a psychologist and a psychiatrist and that's total nonsense because the, the, our daughter was not offered any therapy or any psychology or, or psychiatrist by the John Hunter Hospital. She was referred immediately for hormones. So someone's not telling the truth here. I um, mean, either Dr. Telfer on that ABC program recently wasn't telling the truth or the John Hunter Hospital's not telling the truth. Who, who's telling the truth? Because there was no two years therapy offered to my daughter. And then the second complaint we made was that they falsified her discharge summary and the, the, that also got dismissed. And my husband rung the Health Care Complaints Commission up and said, why did you dismiss that complaint? They falsified her discharge summary. And they said, we, we found out there was an apparent agreement. Oh, this was the part where they said that we the agreed referral the, to yes, the endocrinologist we agreed. was agreed. Mm, by and it. so I put in a separate complaint about that because it was a falsification of, of what happened. And they their response was there was an apparent agreement. And my husband said to them, that's ridiculous. There either was an agreement or there was not an agreement. And there wasn't an agreement and the case officer said to my husband, this case is closed and hung up the phone. So I know many parents who have complained to the Health Care Complaints Commission in New South Wales and they've all had the same treatment we have, dismiss, dismiss, dismiss. I mean, and, and as parents we just feel it's this enormous cover up of what has been done to our children that no one wants to really take ownership of this terrible course of treatment that's being offered to distressed young young people. I mean, I'm in contact with so many parents, parents from all over the world. Um, there's a lot in New South Wales. I've got Adelaide, Western Australia, where we get together, we Zoom together, we talk together as parents to support each other. Our stories are so similar. I know other parents who've had the police called on them. I know other parents who's most of the children are either on the autism spectrum or they've been through some sort of trauma. One friend's daughter had been raped. Other other friend's children have been bullied. So there are all these such similar histories of trauma that have led to mental health problems, anxiety, depression. And this is not fixing our children. This is... a, a, a Band-Aid, it's, it's not only a Band-Aid, it's doing such terrible, irreversible harm. And I, I really, you know, we've all of us have written, I've, I've written so many letters. I've written to the Prime Minister, the Premier, the State, the Federal, the AMA. I wrote so many complaint letters to the hospital. Every letter I've just been dismissed, I've been treated like I was some sort of nutcase. I needed mental health problems to support your transgender child. The, the responses I've got, I mean, you, parents, you just feel, where else do you turn? What else do you do? So and you've obviously, um, you've got quite a lot of contacts with other parents. Yes. So how were you able to develop those contacts? Initially, when I was trying to find people who thought this was all a terrible thing. I had to go through parent groups in the USA. There were parent groups already set up in the USA and it was through the American parents of rapid onset gender dysphoric children that they then put me in contact with a, a lady from Western Australia who was organizing an Australian group. And then that sort of grew and then I met other, I, got onto feminist groups and I met people like Janet and, and 
you know, found these sort of groups that were speaking up about these people who were seemed to have a head on their shoulders that actually could, you know, look objectively at things and say, gee, we weren't doing this to children 20 years ago or even t 10 years ago. Uh, and so, you know, networks have formed and groups have been set up and more parents have reached out and, and I mean, you know, we, we've found each other online and been able to provide support to each other. But it, it's, it's horrific, the stories I read every day of other parents just break your heart. I mean, ter terrible. And, and how and are things for your son now, your younger son? He's 16 now and he is doing well. He was distressed though this year. He went back to school in late, you know, February to... There's a girl in his class now who everyone's calling a boy. And so sadly that's caused him some distress. I really saw a bit of a change in the first term that he, you know, wasn't putting the effort he used to put in at school and he was commenting things to me every week. He would say something about it. I can't believe it, Mum. I can't believe they're calling her, her a boy. This is just ridiculous. What are teachers going along with this for? It clearly disturbed him and upset him. But other than that, he's found a niche. He's actually a part-time referee. He's refereeing soccer a lot. He's refereeing about 10 games a week. He's earning himself lots of money. He's grown in confidence. And he's got his L, just got his L plates. He's doing lots of driving. And he's, he's, he's in a good place. Mm -hmm. But he, he is able to critically see that this is all so, so hard. Mm. And mm. and you know it's to to see that this poor girl at school that people are are going along with this and and it's it just makes me so sad it really does because so what what advice would you give to is there are parents watching this who are at the beginning of what you've been through and your family has been through what suggestions would you have for them. Don't go to a public hospital. Don't go anywhere near a public hospital. Find the, there's a few therapists in Australia who are not affirming therapists and they're the sort of people you need to go to and find. And, and because if you go to your normal GP, they're, they're instructed, they have to affirm. And it's, it's, it's really, really difficult. It, it is, I, I mean, you. You just need to do the research and find those doctors who will try and give your child, th you know, therapy and get to the root of their problems rather than just affirming them immediately. And I mean, there are some good therapists who will do that, but there's not many. And sadly, I mean, this is why we need to lobby to change legislation and why, you know, we need more brave doctors like the doctors at Westmead Hospital who have just, you know, the report that Janet spoke about. We need doctors like that to speak out and voice their concerns because while people are too afraid to speak, it just ends up with more and more children being harmed. And and, it's and do you think it is that, that people are afraid to speak? Absolutely, the absolutely. They're terrified to speak because they could lose their livelihood. They'll be, you know, if they're, if they're a salaried doctor, I mean, in a hospital, the public system, they have to, they have to toe the line. And so affirm is, is you have to affirm this child, like, like the schools have to go along with it. These, there probably may well be teachers at my son's school who think it's terrible going along with it, but they have to call this girl a boy. And until we can change that and, sh and prove the harm that has been done, we're not going to undo this mess. It's a terrible, terrible mess. And luckily we are getting, you know, the US 60 Minutes just had a bit on detransitioners. There are being more people speaking out on, you know, Twitter. There's, I, I think, what do they say? Reddit, detrans Reddit's up to 20,000 people on that. So the detransitioning young people are starting to have a voice 
and that's what we need is to get their voices out because the parents are ignored. Parents are just hamstrung and, and treated appallingly. And, and so until I think we get the voice of the detransitioners, I just got a little booklet. It's been produced by two detransitioning women, one's from Belgium and one's from Germany, and they've just produced this booklet I only received in the mail on Friday. I, I ordered it months ago. And starting to, you know, speak about their experiences, which didn't work transitioning. It didn't fix the problems that, the, you know, there were underlying problems. And so would you, um, this is a, a little book called Gender Detransition, A Path Towards Self-Acceptance. I think you can actually um, get it for free, can't you? Is this I, the one that you I can? I think so. I made a little donation to yes. them and they posted me quite a few copies. So Are I've there any other resources, like just a couple of resources, that you'd recommend for other parents? I mean, it, there's a very good UK site, Transgender Trend, and that's got an enormous amount of Stephanie Davis Ari's behind that, and that's got an absolutely enormous amount of, of research and articles and, and letters for schools and literature. So that is a, a, an excellent resource to, to if you you know want to get proformers of letters to maybe send your school or to you know talk to talk to people what to say and how to approach it you know I've read Abigail's book I've actually just bought this book um, that's another one that's I haven't oh, I'm only just started reading this but by Maria Kepler mm. desist detrans and detox so things are starting to be published there is help is coming out we're about to launch later this month and another international organisation that I won't say too much here because we haven't launched it yet, but I'm going to be the Australian parent face of that organisation and that's got parents and practitioners, psychologists, medical practitioners from all over the world who are speaking up about, you know, the harms of transitioning young people. And okay. so, you know, things are happening, but it's been... A, it's been a tough road and a, you know a long few years and to find people to support you has it has mm. been difficult and a, a very lonely journey but there are more and more parents like me who we have to speak out we have to speak out about the harms thank you very much judith i really appreciate it and i know that every person in this room appreciates it as well and people will have questions to ask uh, once we finish the live stream. So if people could thank Judith for her contribution. Thank you. Thank you. And if you would just stay with me, okay. uh, because we have two more items before the question and discussion section, and I'd like to introduce to you now Jess Mead. Jess is a radical feminist and she's a part of the IWD Brisbane Neangin Network, and she's a poet, a sometime poet, and will read a poem about a topic that is not exactly this topic, but certainly related. Thanks, Jess. Um, maybe just a bit of levity <laughs> now. Um, this is just something I wrote as a handy guide to discussing male violence or anything uh, negative about men on social media. It's called hashtag not all men men. Women must never upset the not all men men. Women need to be wary of men but not not all men men. Women must not appear to be too wary of men because that will upset the not all men men. Women must smile at men, especially not all men men. Women must smile to the degree that says, I don't think you're a potential rapist, especially if it's a not all men man. Women must never smile so much that they're saying, if you did rape me now, it will be my fault because he might be a not not all man, not all men man. 
Women may discuss their own personal safety, but not in the company of a not all man, men man. Women should never discuss their right to personal safety because not all men men may not have personal safety either. Women should never imply or allude to, much less articulate, that the threats to their personal safety might be um, <coughs> men, because not all men men would not threaten women's safety. That's something that not, not all men men do. <laughs> not all men men don't like to think about why women must do all the things that women must do to protect themselves from the not, not all men men. And they shouldn't have to, because damn it, they are not all men, men. Not, not all men, men. Not all men. <laughs> and if women keep deliberately confusing not all men, men, with not, not all men, men, well, they can't be held accountable for what they may or may not do. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jess. We have two small items before we go to questions and discussion. And the first of those is Donna Malone reading a kid's book called My Body Is Me by Rachel Rooney. Donna is a radical feminist and she's also a member of the IWD Brisbane Meangin Network. Thanks, Donna. My body is me. I am my body. My body is me. It's a wonderful thing. I'm sure you'll agree. My body has feelings and thoughts that I own. It's working right now and it will when I've grown. It eats and it drinks. It poops and it wheezes. And it gets flu. It is likely to sneeze. Achoo! I am my body. My body is me. It's a wonderful thing. I'm sure you'll agree. My body can mend from a bruise or a break. Sometimes it sleeps, but it's often awake. It itches and tickles, it slowly grows hair. Mostly it's dressed, in the bath it is bare. I am my body, my body is me. It's a wonderful thing, I'm sure you'll agree. My body can act like a low-flying plane, a mermaid, a dragon, one part of a train. It climbs and it swings like a real chimpanzee. It always gets down and comes home for its tea. I am my body. My body is me. It's a wonderful thing and I'm sure you'll agree. Bodies are different. Children are too. Some prefer pink things and some prefer blue. Some love to get muddy and others do not. Some like cold weather and some like it hot. Sometimes we're gentle and sometimes we're tough. Yes, everybody can do all this stuff. I am my body, my body is me, it's a wonderful thing and I'm sure you'll agree. Wherever you travel, your body goes too. You're never without it, whatever you do. You're born in your body and you don't have a spare, so love it and hug it and treat it with care. Bodies are great, they fit perfectly. I am my body and my body is me. <laughs> Thank you very much, Donna. And don't leave just yet because we have one. Oh, before we go to that, I'll just mention Rachel Rooney is a UK writer and special ed teacher. And because she wrote that book, she was piled on by gender identity ideologues and she received a lot of threats and abuse and hate mail. She even considered stopping her writing of kids' books because of the hate mail. But fortunately for us, she stayed in the game. And because this is part of a raffle, I'll ask Donna to draw the winning ticket. We've been running a raffle for the last few weeks and we've raised $545. And I just have to remember where I put the bowl with the tickets. Yes, it's too late. <laughs> Sorry about that. There will be another one. Just 
just one. <laughs> Sixty-three. Alison? Mm -hmm. Oh, Alison, yes. Okay, great. A Brisbane woman has won. <laughs> Thank you, Donna. So we'll close the live stream now. And if the other two speakers would come and join me and Judith at the front table, we'll have about half an hour for questions and comments.